So ladies and gentlemen, so welcome to the first talk of the series of computer science musings, which is a series of talks that we will be holding in this department to, with a sole goal to inspire, to first see the state of the art of the field and then to inspire the further research. So um, we were very lucky that we are starting the series with the news, with the real news, because new musings. And the first news will be Berina Sinaimeri, so who is our very own Albanian from Albania, from Tirana. So he, she got her PhD from an Ola Shuker uh, higher education at La Sapienza. And uh, it's a very interesting fact that me and her are somehow related in an interesting ways. So one way is uh, that my advisor is a very good friend of her advisor. So then they are both Hungarians. And then, so for some reason we know about each other but never got in touch. And then when Luigi Daura came here, so we went to one of the restaurants and uh, while we all were looking at the, at the menus and checking what the food actually they offer at Sarai, right? Luigi said, I want the Tabe Deo. And I said like, where did you cut that one? He said, like, no, you know, I'm opening Verena's recommendation. Verena said, eat this here. So, and then here we go. So, that's how we met, essentially. So, she told me that she's coming for the Christmas Eve and for the Christmas uh, um, breaks here. And I offered to be the first news, and here she is. And the third one, so interesting, that there's a third relation that I've done five or six years ago something pretty much which comes to her field, which she will be talking today. Okay, Berina, so I hope that I did a good introduction. So now it's yours. So thank you very much for the invitation and thank you to all of you for being here um, today. I'm going to talk about the interface, the interplay between uh, biology and computer science. The thing I'm most interested in is the interaction between species, between organisms. And I want to study this from a mathematical point of view. So let's start. I want to start with, uh, with this claim of Giancarlo Rota, who said, the lack of real contact between mathematics and biology is either a tragedy, a scandal, or a challenge, and it's hard to decide which. When he wrote this sentence, there was already a lot of interaction between mathematics and biology, especially in population genetics. But yet, Giancarlo Rota sees no real contact. And why? This is because the mathematic was used only as a tool for biology. And biology itself has no influence at all in mathematics. Now, from, with the passing of the time, things have changed, and especially in the last decade, there are a lot of uh, biology-inspired problems that influence a lot of progress in mathematics in general, in uh, gra uh, graph theory, in algorithms, in statistics, in combinatorics, uh, in analysis. And what I want to, to, to show you in this talk is exactly this, that biology can be inspiring also for uh, mathematicians. Okay, so uh, I am a theoretical computer scientist, so mainly I'm interested in algorithms, graph theory, complexity. And two years ago, I started working on uh, computational biology, which requires, here, which requires uh, knowledge from biology, computer science, mathematics, and statistics. In my lab, we use mathematical models to study symbiotic interactions between organisms. So I'm saying symbiotic relations. So we are going to talk about symbiosis. So what is symbiosis? Well, uh, there can be different types of symbiosis, but the two extreme types are parasitism and mutualism. Well, parasitism, I think, is quite familiar to all of you because um, it's the relationship between an, uh, organisms where one benefits from the relationship, and the other one is harmed. 
So, for example, this is a typical example that the biologists give, is the gopher and the lice. So the gopher is the host, and the lice is the parasite that lives on the host. And um, in this relationship, of course, the lice benefits and the host is harmed, usually. And this is parasitism. But there can be also relationships when both of the organisms benefit. And this is called mutualism. Now, the example I like to give always is the human microbiota. Now, maybe, I don't know if you know, but uh, every human being on the skin, on its body, contains a lot of uh, microorganisms, a lot of bacteria. Maybe not of all of you know, so this is obvious, you know that there are microorganisms on you. But what you don't know, maybe, is that you have uh, the number of bacteria that lives in your body is 10 times greater than your own cells. So you have 10 more bacteria than cells. And this is quite striking, at least for me. And uh, actually, you cannot live without these bacteria. You have bacteria everywhere. You have bacteria in the guts that help you digest. You have bacteria in the respiratory system, on the skin, everywhere. And without them, you cannot live. And actually, there, uh, the researchers nowadays are trying to consider this as a new organ, this uh, community of bacteria that lives in your skin, in your body, a new organ. Um, how do you be benefit from them? I like to give the example of uh, a pasteurized, I don't know if it's exactly what this way to say it, pasteurized milk. You know, um, now people drink this pasteurized milk uh, because Louis Pasteur defined this method that pasteurized milk, which means that puts it in high temperature and kills every bacteria that is in it. Nowadays, but not all, all of these bacteria were harmful. Some of them are really needed for the organism in order to digest the milk. This is why, for, with the passing of the time, many people nowadays are allergic, cannot digest lactose, you cannot digest milk. This is because they don't, you, uh, we are used to drink this pasteurized milk with no bacteria, and we are not helping the organism to develop the right bacteria to, to digest it. So, uh, studying and getting aware of these uh, organisms that live in your body, it's quite essential and it's a, a, a line, a research line that it's, nowadays is progressing very quickly. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about parasitism. And uh, we are interested in these uh, systems, parasite systems, host parasite systems. And I want to study them through time. I want to see their relationship, how have they evolved together, and to study their inter interaction through time. So, why do I want to do this? Why am I interested to see their association in time? Well, just think about it. First thing is that more than 70%, more than 70% of emergent human diseases come from uh, zoonosis. Zoonosis are this type of parasite that changes host. From one host, they pass to another. So, um, more than 70% of, uh, of human diseases are caused by parasites that jump from animals, from other organisms, to humans. So studying how long their relationship has been will help you to develop better ways to combat them, to defeat them. Moreover, it's also interesting by itself to study the relationship between host and parasite systems just to see how to determine the rates of evolution of the host of the parasite. Who evolves quicker? Is it the host that evolves quicker? And then what does the parasite do? Has, is it obliged to follow the evolution of the host? And moreover, I would like to know uh, how long is the association between host and parasite. So is it a new uh, infection or it is a, has a long history? Okay, so um, we are going to see, uh, to study this long-term relationship and then we, uh, necessary we talk about evolution. Talking about evolution, we have to talk about evolutionary trees or phylogenetic trees. So what is a phylogenetic tree? Well, you know that every organism uh, develops, evolves, and this evolution comes uh, mainly through one process which is called speciation, which means from no species you, you generate new species. Now, uh, 
this history of evolution is usually, uh, usually represented by a tree, where in the leaves, so the nodes who do not have other children, in the leaves you have the organisms of interest, or the existing species, and the internal nodes of this tree represent uh, these nodes moments of speciation. So moments where the, from old species to be new species. Okay, so what is the problem? The main problem in phylogenetics is the following. You have the set of taxa, you have the set of organisms, existing ones, and you want to infer the tree, you want to infer the evolutionary history of them, because you don't know. <laughs> so this is what you have, and the tree is what you want to get. Now, the trees can be different types in mathematics, so for, of course it's clear that this is a um, mathematical problem. So the trees that you can have can be of different types. Well, you can have rooted trees. Rooted means that there is a node in the tree, uh, a vertex or a node in the tree, which is commonly accepted as the common ancestor of all the tasks, of all the uh, all the um, organisms of interest. Otherwise, if you don't, can, you cannot assume this information. Then the tree is unrooted. Usually, the trees are binary, which means that every internal has two children, so this has two children, one here and one here, because speciation works like that, so you generate new species. But it can be also, in many cases, you are going to see trees with, uh, when one node has more than two children, and this usually uh, corresponds to errors, for example, because you don't know how to assign, how to construct correctly which is the ancestor of who. But in my talk, I don't want to go into detail, so I'm going to consider only uh, rooted or unrooted trees but uh, all of them are binary, so every node has two children. Okay. So, how do you construct this tree? What is the algorithmic problem that, uh, how can I construct this tree, the phylogenetic trees? Well, uh, you have to take the organisms of interest, so what do you take from them? Well, one method considers the DNA sequence of the organisms. Okay, so suppose now, this is a toy example, suppose now you have four organisms, and this is the sequence of DNA associated to each of them. Now, of course, DNA is longer, but just for the example, I'm putting just three symbols. Okay, hope you know that the DNA is a string of uh, four of uh, four symbols on an uh, alphabet of size four, so A, G, T, C. So I have this four, and I want to construct, let's say, an unrooted binary tree that uh, best represents the evolutionary history of this of these sequences. So, what are the possibilities that I can have? If the tree is binary, so every internal node should have two children, these are the only possibilities you can have. So you can put the sequences S1, S2 together, and S2 together, S1 and S3 together, and S1 and S4 together. Okay, now, let's find the best tree. Now, uh, what does best mean? Is, it, is, the, is the word, is this uh, problem well defined? Like this, so just look at them and find the best one. Well, if you are a biologist, maybe for you it is, because then you can define an experiment that uh, uh, helps you to choose between them. But if you are a computer scientist, then the problem has no meaning for you. Determining the, what does best mean, you need a criteria. And uh, one criteria that you can have is based on the so-called um, Occam razor, which says that the simplest explanation is likely the best one, is probably the best one. So this is called maximum parsimony, and it tells you that, look, the best tree is the one that minimizes the number of mutations across the ages. What does it mean? So suppose that I assign to this internal vertex here, to this internal, to this internal vertex here, I assign this sequence, A, G, G, this one. So if you look at this species here and this species here, there is no mutation. They are identical. But if you look at these two, there are two mutations have occurred. One, the C has been transformed in G, and the A has been transformed in T. Okay, so two mutations. You can do the same thing with these two. You assign a, a, a label here, and you count. So here, again, you have two mutations, and between these two, you have one notation, and so on, so forth. So, in this way, what we have, you 
the total number of mutations in the first one is 4, 5, and 7. Now, which is the best three then? Well, I want the one that explains with the minimum number of mutations, so this one is the best three. Okay, so if you have questions or anything, you can stop me at any moment. Just raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so four. Good. So computer scientist tells you this is the best three. Of course, the biologist doesn't know, doesn't, doesn't mean that this is the real biological tree that explains perfectly the, the evolutionary history. It just tells you that from a computer science, the minimization problem tells you uh, this is the best one. So, uh, if you are going to formalize this, this problem and uh, design, run an algorithm or design and implement an algorithm for it, I should write like this. So we have an input and, and DNA sequences and the goal is to find the tree that minimizes the number of mutations along the edges. What is a possible algorithm for this? Well, you can do as I showed you before. You can check for every possible tree. You can compute the score this cost, you can calculate, and then uh, find the one with minimum number of mutations. Unfortunately, this is not very efficient. This because the possible number of unrooted trees is this beautiful number here, which is uh, exponential. So uh, in computer science, probably you know that an algorithm is efficient if it is polynomial in the size of the input. And this, no, this will, compute, uh, will, uh, will run for a very long time. So it's completely unpractical. Actually, this problem, it's NP-hard, which means that uh, until now, you cannot even, uh, there is no polynomial algorithm that solves this. And it's believed that maybe there will be never one. But okay, the problem is there. What you can do, what you should do, you should solve it somehow, you should, you should deal with it, even if it's too complex. Well, then uh, in general, when in computer science, when you go for um, optimal, it's very difficult to find the optimal solution, then you relax the problem and you want some solution, a solution. You don't want the optimal one. So for example, <laughs> so, um, there are two kinds of uh, approaches here. You can go for heuristic or you can go for an approximation algorithm. So what is the difference between them? Suppose this is um, in this picture, I, this is the space of all the possible solutions for your problem that you have, and they are grouped by quality. So the darker, the best. Okay, the darker, the, the stars, the best. So, what about the heuristic? Well, heuristics gives you one solution, say that one, but gives no information about how far the solution is from the optimal. So, in particular, it can say to you, look, I found a solution that costs 100. Great. Well, is it really great? It depends. If the optimal cost was 95, then it's really great because we are very near, 100 is very near to the optimal. But if the optimal cost was five, then no, this is a very bad solution. The point is that the heuristic cannot guarantee it. But yet, in biology, you use them. I thought in theory, you cannot give um, guarantees, assure, you cannot assure anything in most of the cases. In practice, sometimes they work, and they are very efficient. And, um, Heuristic is, um, is an area in co that is uh, developing very much in, in computational biology. And I will turn back to this in the open problems after. While approximation algorithms are more um, robust, somehow they give you more information. They will give you a solution, as before, but they will give you also a measure that says, how, a pessimistic measure of how uh, far can this solution be from the optimal one. In particular, it will tell you, okay, I found a solution that cost 100, but I can guarantee that this, at most, in the worst case, can be at most 1.2 times uh, worse than the optimal. Now, of course, you'd like, um, if you want to have control of what's happening, you'd like to have approximation algorithms. But the point is that approximation algorithms are more difficult and um, more difficult to find. 
So you still go for heuristic. Okay, so um, what, I, what I want to talk now, so heuristics and approximation algorithms are uh, two lines of research in biology. But I started with interaction between, um, between organisms. So I told you that I wanted to study the, the, the inter this interaction through time, through evolving time. Well, uh, there is this term in, uh, in biology that is called coevolution. Coevolution occurs when uh, two organisms that usually are, uh, interact a lot with each other influence each other's evolution. So one's evolved, the other also. Now, coevolution has uh, a long history and it's well studied. And it started with Darwin when he found in his, uh, he found his orchidea, his flower, this flower here, that had a very long spore. So a very long spore. And then he conjectured that there must be uh, insects with a long tongue, otherwise they cannot be pollinated. So he said, okay, there must be an insect which has a long tongue. And he didn't know it, he didn't, so he didn't see it. Well, around uh, 100 years after, the insect was found, and there is this moth here, and this string that you see, this long string, is the tongue of the moth. So it's clear that uh, these two animals have co-evolved, have influenced, have co-evolved together. But uh, how can we study this problem in, from a mathematical point of view? Well, let's take again the example of our gopher and lice. You have the phylogenetics, suppose we have the phylogenetic tree that represents the evolutionary history of the gopher here. And you have the phylogenetic tree of the lice here. You have calculated them. Let's assume they are correct. And then you have some um, uh, a mapping, an association between the leaves of these two trees, represented by the dotted line, that tells that this parasite influences this host. So, or this parasite influences, uh, infects this host here, and so on. So, looking at these two trees, what can you say? Uh, have they co-evolved together? Well, we don't know. So, first, the first idea that came to mind is that let's check how similar the trees are. Just look at the trees. If they are very, very similar, so, or identical, then you, are, uh, uh, you can think that they have co-evolved. So when one species, the other has species also. So in this context, there is a branch of um, uh, combinatorics that started developing measures to compare trees, to see how similar two, two phylogenetic trees are. Well, uh, one of them is the, the so-called uh, subtree prune and graft method uh, of distance, which, which is done like this. So you have this tree, and you consider this operation. You pick an age, and you cut it, and then you choose another age somewhere in the tree, an arc tree, and then you reattach the prune subtree to the new vertex. And you obtain this, this tree here. Of course, you, uh, in this process, you have to eliminate this, uh, the one degree vertices because, from a biological point of view, they don't have any meaning. So, uh, all the vertices correspond to speciation, so they have two, two children at least. So, a distance then can be determined as the minimum given to trees. You want to find the minimum number that passes from, uh, of this operation that changes one tree to the other. What is the minimum number? So if, the, this, if this was the initial tree and this is the last tree, this minimum number is one. With one movement, you can, you can obtain the other. Now, unfortunately, again, as many uh, problems in uh, biology, also this problem is empty hard. The good news is that you can find a free approximation algorithm. And uh, the algorithm is very simple, and I can, I can even show it or give the idea. And the interesting part is that the algorithm was inspired by considering this problem completely in graph theory, in mathematics, forgetting at all about biology. So, how can we reformulate it in mathematics? In graph theory, I'm sorry. So, you have two trees, and then uh, the problem of finding the minimum distance can be reformulated or is equivalent as follows. 
you want to find the minimum number of ages to delete from this tree and from the other tree in order to obtain two graphs, two these are called forests, because they are a union of small trees. So two forests that are identical. So what is the minimum number of ages to delete here and here in order to obtain two identical forests? Well, in this case, you can delete these two ages, so this here, this here, this here, this here, and in both cases you'll end up with this, with this forest. So this number is two in this case, in this case. And the algorithm that finds a three approximation basically works like this. So he finds, starts with two leaves, finds uh, that are connected with the new with the vertex with the common vertex, and checks, for example, A, B here, okay? and checks in the other three where A and B are. If A and B are, in the, are connected together, so are children, both children of the same vertex, then it says, oh, good, they, are, they will always stay together in the forest, they are identical, so let's merge these two vertices in a new one, okay? And so in, so, in such a way, we reduce size of the tree, remove one vertex. Otherwise, what can happen is that they, they appear, but there are things between them. They are not under the same ver uh, node, under the same vertex. Then what you do is that, in this case, you delete three ages. You delete A, B, so you delete A, B, and you delete one of the ages that goes in a subtree between them. So you delete three ages. And I have to, to obtain a three approximation algorithm, I have to convince you that one of these three ages was needed. But what are the possible cases for A and B? Well, either A and B are in the same small subtree, but this means that this age is cut, has been cut, or they are in different subtrees, but this means that one of these two is cut. So in both cases, the the one of these ages needs to be cut. Now, okay, so maybe it's not, I just wanted to say you that, uh, to give you the idea that this is uh, very simple, and somehow, for people that do uh, algorithms, work on this area, and still, it's still open, and it looks to you that you can improve it. It's very simple, I can show it like this. You can improve it, but actually it's an open problem to improve this factor, to find a better algorithm that works better than this. Than this. And we are working on this problem, but we didn't find until now the solution. A better cannot beat the three until now. Okay. Um, so turning back, so a way that compares the, the, the to compare this way to compare the trees was was uh, introduced for determining if the if the two animals have co-evolved. It was the first method, but then it was abandoned because it was not so. Um, so meaningful biologically. Why? First, because it treats, it's very symmetric. The distance between trees is very symmetric. It's a symmetric thing. It doesn't take into account which is the tree of the host and which is the tree of the parasite. Actually, in biology, what you think is that the host drives the evolution of the parasite. So the host influences the parasite's evolution. So the question to be asked is not how similar the two trees are, is how much the host evolution has driven the parasite's evolution. So the last method that is used nowadays for analyzing this is, um, is based on some type of events that can happen. So they say, okay, so they have uh, lived together for long and long years. So what kind of events could have taken place in a way that these two trees don't look as identical now? Well. Let's see this figure here. The tube represents the host, and the dotted line represents the parasite. Now here in the tube, you see a, a, a speciation, so it creates two new species. And if you see inside, also the parasite speciate, so creates new species. This event is called co-speciation. They co-speciate, they speciate together almost in the same time somehow. What else can happen? Well, the parasite can speciate inside the host without any stimulus from the host. This is rarely happens in host parasite system, but it can happen. 
And this event is called duplication. So the parasite species, the host node. We can have the inverse problem, uh, the inverse case, when the, the host species and one of the new species becomes resistant to the parasite. So it lost the parasite. And the parasites fall only one, uh, one species. And this is called loss. And the most interesting, maybe, uh, event that you can have is that host switch. Host switch means that the parasite jumps from one, one host to another, so infects another host. This problem, this, uh, of course, this uh, implies that the host, these organisms must be contemporary in time. The, the, the organisms when you jump. So uh, the method, the mathematical method that you use here is the following. You, somehow you want to map the parasite tree into the host tree. So you assign, you define a function that you want to find uh, this function that assigns to every node of the parasite tree a node in the host tree, a vertex in the host tree. And um, in this way, this function will determine you the set of events that have taken place. And this will explain somehow the history of coevolution of these two, two organisms. Now, of course, even in this case, there are a lot of functions. You can have infinite functions. No, infinite, no, but okay, you can have a lot of functions uh, that, um, uh, that, that possible functions in this case. So how do you choose between them? Again, you use the parsimony criteria. criteria. You start by giving cost to the events, give like say, let's say duplication of one, host speciation two, um, host switch four, and so on. And then you find the best function is the one that include that, that determines a minimum number of uh, total costs. Okay, what are the news? What is the state of art of this problem? Well, again, finding one solution is a bit hard, and um, the complexity rises from the difficulty, well, exactly from the difficulty of host switches. Because it's very difficult to check with uh, these host switches, to check that you don't go back in time. Because sometimes you, you can do like this, you can switch from one host to another, switch, and then switch back. But in this case, this is not, has no biological meaning because you are switching to, uh, to species that do not exist anymore. And you go, so this is not possible. So again, uh, in this case, what you do is that somehow you relax the problem and, um, and you try to, to generate as many solutions as possible and to find one that has a meaning, is biologically meaningful. So, an algorithmic problem that is not, in this area is quite important, but I think also in all of the, in many areas in biology, is uh, the so-called enumeration algorithm. You want to enumerate all the solutions. You want to generate all the solutions. Okay, but you want to generate them efficiently. And uh, efficiently, I mean that I cannot, I, I have to have a, a very efficient algorithm because the input, so I showed you the, the two trees before, which were like a toy example, the gopher and the lice, with 11 leaves, but the trees really can be like this. So this, these two trees, uh, this one is an anthropod, a species of anthropods, which are like spiders, for example, and uh, this one is a bacteria, which is called Wolbachia, that infects anthropods. And uh, you can have this type, this size of input, so the algorithm should be very efficient. But um, it, it should be a different kind of efficiency, because it's not, it's not the same time. The main problem here is that you cannot use the same notion of complexity as uh, in general uh, complexity, uh, you, when you talk about complexity of algorithms. Why? You cannot even, and sometimes here you cannot even aim for a polynomial algorithm. Because just listing all the solutions can be exponential. Because the number of solutions itself is exponential. So what is the best algorithm you can aim for in this case? Well, this, um, this is a new class of, uh, of algorithms in computer science, which is called enumeration algorithms. And one of the classes that are most efficient are called polynomial delay algorithms. So you have to generate all the solutions, but, this, and this number can be exponential, you cannot do anything for it, but what you can do is that the time that passes from one solution to another is polynomial in the input. So it's a short time. So you don't have to wait 
a lot for getting the next solution. Now, the development of efficient uh, polynomial delay algorithms is currently uh, very important uh, in combinatorial biology, in phylogenetics, cofilogeny, and um, also in other areas of biology, like next generation sequencing or, or others. So, um, I, will, uh, I will now conclude by saying that there are a lot of open problems in this area. So, the, first of all, the method that I explained before, the, the mapping, I didn't enter into the details of how it works or the mathematical things, uh, but of course it's not real, too much realistic. Why? Because first, the first thing that you have to complain is that the cost values that we, of the events influence the choice. So how do you choose these numbers that I told you before? The cost of post-precision, post-switch duplication, etc. Because the solution depends on them. And there is no biological information that you can use a priori to set them. So it's good to have methods that do not depend so much on cost values. In this case, then, you, are, you go for statistic and probabilistic methods. And they are quite used nowadays in, uh, in cofilogeny. Another thing that we are, it's interesting here, is that we are considering just one tree, one host, and one parasite. But usually in nature it's not like that, we have communities, we have more hosts and more parasites. More different type, and different type, not different species. So, uh, and we have to consider also the environment where they live. So we have to take into account the ecological factors. And uh, this also has a... Um, has, now, now this, this understanding, the influence of the environment in the organism is nowadays a very challenging problem in uh, computational biology, especially with the problem of antibiotics. For example, you should know that um, nowadays uh, antibiotics are, uh, every day there are new and new antibiotics that are coming out. And this is because the uh, bacteria, you know, the bacteria uh, uh, multiplies very quickly, so they evolve very quickly. So they're becoming more and more resistant to antibiotics. And the antibiotics industry cannot take, stay behind. It's very much behind nowadays with this uh, quick evolvement of the bacteria. And actually, for example, you should know that every time you take an antibiotic, the doctor tells you that, okay, you should finish the cure. This is because if you don't finish and there is some bacteria inside you that is not dead yet, then this becomes resistance and gives rise to a new population that is resistant to this uh, antibiotics now. And so in this way you harm also the, not only yourself, but everybody. The point is that you cannot go further with this kind of technology. So at some point the antibiotics will not be sufficient. You cannot anymore. So what are a new method is to analyze and change the environment of the bacteria. Instead of fighting the bacteria itself, you consider and you mo uh, modify the environment where they live. Because, for example, there are uh, peak, in the peak, in peaks, there are some bacteria, and when they are in the uh, respiratory system, they are harmed. They don't do anything. They, they stay there, okay. But if they move from the respiratory system to the gas, so, uh, they became har harmful. So the peak dies. So why they move? So understanding what makes them move. Uh, and what makes them uh, become aggressive at some point, it's uh, crucial in, uh, uh, in, this, in this way of thinking. Okay, and another, another thing that I want to, to talk is that the methodology as explained before, so with this mapping, it works for host parasite systems, but can work also for different types of systems. For example, is the um, mimicry, which means that one uh, animal mimics the other one, it uh, can be potentially explained using the same techniques. Now, this here are two phylogenetic trees of two butterfly species. So, Erato and uh, Melfomena. So, I want to show you how similar, how they mimic each other. So, look, here we have one of this side and the other. They look quite similar. They are different, they are different species. So, oh. So why do these species mimic each other, mimic the other? Well, it happens, for example, that one of the species is um, poisoned. 
So it means that if birds eat it, they die. So the birds don't eat it. The other species mimics this one to take advantage of this feature because the, uh, the birds recognize the patterns of the butterflies and don't eat it. So they mimic this one. But with the passing of the time, what happens is that birds try to eat this non poisoned butterflies a lot, so they get unlearned, so they don't understand anymore that this species is harmful, is dead, because they eat a lot of uh, mimic, the ones that mimic, and they don't have poison. So what they do is that then, uh, this, thing, this feature is not an advantage anymore, so the poisoned butterfly has to, to change, so evolves with a different pattern, and then the other one evolves again, and so this uh, evolutionary uh, exchange, let's say, uh, between them can go on for infinity. But it's, it's nice to understand what are the causes that trigger this kind of uh, behavior. And finally, okay, so uh, finally, what, what uh, in phylogenetics, everybody talks about trees, phylogenetic trees, even Darwin itself considered trees. But nowadays, people are starting to think that uh, uh, maybe trees are not the right structure to, to represent the evolutionary history. So, why? Uh, <laughs> uh, why? Because they, they think that maybe networks, which is, which, which is uh, simply a directed acyclic graph, but okay, you can see any kind of structure, can represent better the evolutionary history. Why? Because sometimes the data that you came um, comes with errors. The data is not never, the sequence is never perfect or whatever. So to, to, to take into account the events like recombination or to take into account errors in the data of, or horizontal gene transfer, you need more complicated structures. And the ones now that are uh, in the lately uh, coming out are these kind of networks. And all the problems you have asked for trees now you can ask for this type of structure. And, uh, and the last thing I want to say is that I talked about heuristics and I said to you that heuristics are very much used in biology. And um, in computer science, uh, I told you that heuristics have worked very well in practice, but you don't have a mean to prove, you, don't, you cannot, it's very difficult to prove something for them, usually. In computer science, what you do is that you say, okay, so this algorithm doesn't work well in all the cases, but in some cases it works well. And what they do is that exactly they try to formalize these typical cases, the typical input. For example, in a random input, uh, the heuristics works very well, always finds the optimum, for example. <laughs> this thing, so formalizing, so you can make a proof after the program, you can have the uh, assurance, the guarantee that it works. In, in uh, biology, you cannot, it's very difficult this thing because you cannot formalize the input. It's very difficult to determine what is the typical input in biology. So how can you, um, how can you evaluate the heuristics? Have you, have you to take them into uh, blindness? Like, okay, uh, it works or whatever. So, and this is, uh, quite important, and nowadays there are a lot of researchers that try to find methods on um, evaluating and comparing heuristics. And they have to take into account different things like time, uh, the quality of the solution, the perturbation in data, so they have to work in data with errors or with not errors, etc. So, finally, I just want to conclude by saying that um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, so uh, there are a lot of interesting problems in uh, biology that require knowledge from uh, mathematics, statistics, computer science, um, and, and there is a lot of uh, interesting, um, interesting problems in this area. So thank you very much for your attention and questions. Yeah. And the uh, stranger.
Yeah. So the moth must have been in a position that uh, it didn't have any, any, any other source of food, otherwise it will fly unless it uh, has a long term to suck the, the orchidea. But the orchidea doesn't have any interest to, yeah. to change morphologically, so why the toy evolution? Yeah, actually, yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's a mystery. So what happens is that actually it is not known, and uh, there are a lot of hypotheses about why this happens. So one hypothesis is that um, the orchidea wanted to maximize to the uh, okay to maximize the, the let's say the pollinating thing. So if the if the wanted to oblige the insect to go inside inside it, so in, in order to take more and more uh, is to stay longer in the tube. So it takes more pollen. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> yes, yes. So, for is for orchidea a reason to get a in the species if there is no insect that will cycle it? Uh, okay, so... Because I can understand yeah. there are major reasons when you are able, I mean, you will be forced to morphologically change, but yeah. okay, so in for this convenience, it's a little bit not very convincing, I think. Oh, you know, yeah, uh, in this case, I told you that it's still enough, so there is this thing. And then the, the, the moth, uh, um, the the moth developed growth this uh, long time in order uh, also for example to, to okay okay to, to take the food etc. The point is that, yes to survive. So now there is another thing that says that uh, there is a third factor. This is one of the hypotheses, maybe not convincing, but there is another one that says there is a third actor in the scene that obliges the um, uh, the, the moth. To go, so the moth evolves first the tongue because it doesn't want to go inside, and then the thing the orchidea evolves after it. Now, what happens? You don't know. Now, during evolution, there are a lot of forces that drive evolution. One of them is uh, mutation. You know, so uh, you have to have a, a mutation. It happens by chance. So uh, evolution doesn't occur, uh, doesn't find the best way always. No. Um, so it can occur by chance, and then. Do we have to take into it's the selective uh, pressure that uh, decides somehow uh, to keep it or not, to keep this change or not? But also there are other factors that have to be taken into account, like uh, for example migration or um, genetic trait also that uh, means that you know uh, some, some. But it's still, but you're right. It's still it's uh, it's a uh, it's a mystery of how of how these two uh, why these two animals. Have have co-evolved together, but it's clear that they they have interacted, so they have co-evolved. But why they did it, we don't know. Yes. So, uh, in, in this particular uh, case, in Cofilogeny, um, the heuristics that we use are mainly genetic algorithms. Okay, so uh, the point is that the genetic algorithm doesn't perform well in this, in this, in this particular problem. In general, in biology, they, they perform well. But in this particular problem, they don't perform that. So people, uh, researchers, go still for finding the uh, listing all the solutions and checking which one is the most uh, biologically meaningful. <laughs> or they try to relax a little bit the problem and say, okay, we don't exactly want to know that in this in this moment it happened at this event or etc. But we want to have some kind of estimate of the number of the events only. So let's say uh, these two organisms have co-evolved and uh, statistically speaking, I expect to have, let's say, 50% of the events that happened are co speciation, so it's a good thing because they have influenced each other, or can be, um, or can be host switching, a lot of host switching, so they are not uh, dependent, so the parasite is not dependent on the host. The data you can have on this type of, uh, of uh, problems are molecular data from phylogenetic trees. So, yeah, we have, we have data. Oh, for example, the whole bucket, I said you. Uh, yeah. uh, the comparison of how the supply, which algorithm seems to be performing better. Yeah, so. 
as heuristics, there are only few, like let's say like three algorithms, maybe, that uh, are based, all of them in uh, genetics, genetic inspired algorithms, and they behave more or less the same. But they are not used, that's why there is not so much, they are not used in this field, that's why there is not uh, so much interest to benchmark against them. Yes. The model is not, it's not the same, I think, because in co-evolutionary, the crucial thing is that you have to model somehow this type of events, and that's what you are interested in, in, the, in, in these post switches, in these duplications, in these losses, and uh, in this type of things. I don't know how this can be modeled in uh, similarity in the... Um, yeah. 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 Because for trees, yeah, and they are symmetric, and they have the same problem of, uh, of before, the matrix of the two trees.
Any other questions? If you have a good question, I will just make it. My students are still cascading. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Feel free to ask. If there are no other questions, so then let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for the next series of musings, for the next talk. So we have some refreshments outside, so please feel free to come and join. Talk to Irina, talk to us. So thank you all. Thank you.